In this video, I'm going to be doing a full momentum overview for AP Physics 1, which will be a good review for any high school physics class or introductory college classes as well. Uh, we're going to be checking out um, what momentum is and impulse, taking a look at those concepts, formulas, and a couple graphs. Uh, then we're going to move on to different types of collisions um, and taking a look at conservation of momentum and energy. And finally, we're going to be taking a look at the problem solving methods, strategies, um, analyzing different kinds of collisions and making sure we can distinguish between them based on descriptions and numerical values as well. So let's go ahead and get started and talk about what is momentum and impulse. So momentum is the amount of motion that an object has. Um, oftentimes it's also described as inertia and motion. And both of those definitions aren't really great for getting a full understanding of what it is. Um, but when you take a look at the different formulas and applications of it, that's where you really develop that conceptual understanding of it. So momentum is represented by a lowercase p, and it is the product of mass and velocity. And to show the amount of motion of an object, it, how much stuff is it composed of is the first factor, which is mass that is measured in kilograms. And then the second factor that is significant is how quickly that mass is moving in meters per second. Now for momentum, it doesn't have its own special unit. You actually just take these two and combine them and you get a kilogram meter per second. So it's basically after you get the product of the mass and the velocity, you combine those units as well. Now, when you're taking a look at impulse, impulse is a change in momentum. So change in is shown with the symbol delta. So delta P, the change in momentum is impulse. Sometimes it's also shown with a J as well, but delta P I believe is a little bit more common. So when you're taking a look at impulse, you can take a look at it one of two ways. If you wanna find the change in anything, you can always do the final minus initial value. So you can take the final momentum minus the initial momentum, which we'll call it P naught. And if you wanted to find that Delta P, then you could do MV final minus MV naught, which is the initial velocity. And then if you factor out the M, then you have VF minus V naught, okay? That's one of the formulas that is not on the AP Physics 1 formula sheet, um, but it's basically just taking this formula MV and using it twice to find the change in anything. So the one that is provided um, looks like this. It is the change in momentum equals the force times the change in time. And we're probably pretty familiar with force at this point, which is um, how much something gets pushed or pulled in Newtons, which is a requirement to cause an impulse. So an impulse is basically a force acting on an object that changes its velocity, therefore changing its momentum. Okay? It could also change its mass, which is much less likely. So typically it's a change in the velocity like we see here, VF minus V naught. And then our delta T is the time of impact. So that time of impact is typically a little bit shorter than our regular time. Our time elapsed normally might be something like seven, eight seconds, 30 seconds. Uh, a time of impact, say for example, a baseball bat hitting a baseball, that could be something like you know, 0 0.02 seconds. Um, so a lot of times that time of impact might be fairly small. Now, there are a bunch of relationships associated with this formula. So if you go ahead and take a look at this formula and rearrange it to solve for force, then it looks like this. It becomes delta P over T equals F. So the more impulse you have, the more force you have, and the more time you have, the less force you have. That is the main um that's one of the main relationships in there is that if there's more time of impact, then you decrease the force and then vice versa. If you have a smaller time of impact, then the force rises. Okay. For example, if you are catching something, if you move your hands backwards while you're catching it, if you're catching something fragile like a water balloon or an egg and you move your hands back with it and create a little bit more time of impact as you're stopping it, then you decrease the force greatly. Just like if you take um, an egg and you drop it on a concrete, it gets stopped very, very quickly. That time of impact is extremely small, so that force is extremely large. Um, but if you took that egg and you dropped it into um, a pool of water, it would give it much more time to stop and that greater um, impact time will decrease the force greatly. 
Um, the second thing to look at would be this. Um, if you were to increase the impulse, you're basically increasing the velocity. So that could be done one of two ways. The first way is, is a little bit more obvious. If you want to hit something faster and farther, if you hit it with a greater force, that is going to help create more velocity and a greater increase in momentum. But the time of impact is one of the parts that people don't often think about. So if you want a greater impulse, you can either one, increase the force, which is pretty obvious, like I said, or increase the time of impact. So a lot of times when they talk about um, following through and then creating a, that impact time or increasing that impact time, excuse me, um, that is going to increase your impulse and increase your velocity overall. And then there's one more idea that is fairly common with impulse, and that is looking at it graphically. So if you take a look at a graph that is a force versus time graph, if something receives an impact from an object, which could just be a wall, a person, an, just any object of any sort, um, what might happen is that that force might spike and then drop back down. And if you see any kind of force versus time graph, so let's go ahead and put force versus time there, um, what you can do is if you find the area beneath the curve, that's going to give you the impulse. Okay, the reason why that would give you the impulse is because when you take the product of force and time, as we saw over here in red, that is going to give you the impulse. So if you find the area of this, that is going to equal your delta P. So you would just basically use, you know, one half base times height if it's some kind of triangular space like that. Um, but whatever the case is, if you find the area underneath the curve for any force versus time graph, that is going to give you your impulse. Now with momentum, you are largely going to be looking at a lot of collisions typically, and there's something called an open versus closed system. A lot of times you're analyzing a closed system. Um, a closed system is a case where that there are no external forces. Uh, influencing your system of objects, um, therefore keeping the momentum constant um, within that system. If it is open, then there is a change in momentum for the entire system. So typically when you're taking a look at a collision problem, it's something like this where the total momentum before the collision equals the total momentum after the collision. Now, two large categories um, for collisions are um, elastic. Let's fix that. Um, elastic and inelastic. So for both of these, um, momentum is conserved. which means this right here is the total amount of momentum of all objects within our system before the collision and after the collision will be exactly the same. But the difference between them is that um, energy may not be conserved. So for elastic, um, your total energy is conserved and you'll have the same amount before and after the collision. For an inelastic collision, your total amount of energy is not conserved so those are going to differ so it's usually the total amount of kinetic energy in the beginning does um, does equal the total amount of kinetic energy after the collision and for this one it does not now between the two a lot of times elastic is called a bouncing collision and then inelastic is called a sticking collision where the two masses combined. So it does do this sticking if it is perfectly inelastic. And that's where you would use that term. So if you hear the word perfectly inelastic, that means they are going to stick together and combine masses. But in any case where the momentum is conserved, but the kinetic energy is not conserved, that would be considered inelastic. Um, and then for elastic collision, um, everything is conserved as far as energy 
and momentum are concerned. And with these, they are hitting each other and then they are separating after the collision, not necessarily bouncing in different directions, but we'll just say they're separating after the collision. So when you're given a scenario, typically it's gonna be in the form of a word problem. Sometimes there's gonna be some graphics there. So the first thing I would do is I would highly recommend drawing everything before and after the collision. And there's many reasons for that, which I'll explain as we move along. So say for example, we have two spheres, a two kilogram sphere and a one kilogram sphere that are colliding with each other. So if they're moving towards each other and colliding, um, we are going to make sure that we label them as before and after, as in before the impact and after the impact. Now, based on our description, we're going to get some certain values here. So let's say, for example, this one's moving at two meters per second to the right, and this one's moving at um, three meters per second to the left. That is going to indicate that we're going to want to put a negative sign if we have something in the opposite direction. And then for the two kilogram object, maybe afterwards it slows down and it goes down to one meter per second. And then we're going to find what the velocity is for this object. Okay, so we're going to do a few different things. Number one, we're first going to solve for the final velocity of that one kilogram object. Um, number two, we are going to figure out what type of collision it is if it is elastic or inelastic sometimes people would just jump to the conclusion that it's elastic because there are two things that are bouncing off of each other and then number three we're going to do the problem in a different way with a different perspective using impulse so then after we do a full very very thorough analysis of this collision then we're going to hit a ton of ideas all right so the first thing is we want a before and after column we're going to label everything that helps with organization and it helps a lot with recognizing our positive and negative signs Okay, so typically the rule of thumb that I follow that you could follow too is that everything going to the right on my page is positive and everything going to the left is negative. But positive and negative just really mean opposite direction, um, but those are the directions that I choose. All right, so we know that momentum is conserved in both cases. So that means the mass times velocity of everything. So I'll do two times two plus one times negative three, and that's gonna give us four plus negative three and then we have four and negative three which sum up to one kilogram meter per second so the total amount the total amount of momentum for the entire system considering it's a closed system with no external forces the total momentum is one kilogram meter per second which means that after the collision the total of the momenta for both of these two would equal one kilogram meter per second so if we do um, two times one we got two kilogram meters per second plus one and i'll call it vf because it's a final velocity and then if we subtract two from both sides then we're going to get negative one equals one vf so in the end vf equals negative one meter per second okay so that concludes our first question of how you solve for an unknown velocity the second thing we're going to do is we know that momentum is conserved but we don't know if energy is conserved so what we want to do is we want to use the formula one half mv squared the one that we use for kinetic energy so we already have all the values we need but we're going to go ahead and do one half m v squared for our first object before the collision and then do the same thing for the one kilogram object before the collision one half m v squared okay and we're going to see if that equals the kinetic energy, the total kinetic energy on the other side. So we have one half um, V squared plus one half, um, and then that's our new final velocity that we just figured out, MV squared. All right, so we can go ahead and uh, do some quick math here. So we have one half times two is one, two times uh, two or two squared is gonna be four. So we have four joules plus, and then at negative three squared is nine, nine times one is nine um, and then nine times one half is four and a half and then over here one times two is one and then times one is still one and then finally uh, one squared is one times one times one half which is 0.5 okay so now we know that these two clearly do not equal each other that we have four plus four and a half which is equal to eight and a half joules 
which clearly does not equal 1 plus 0.5, 1.5 joules, which would mean that it's an inelastic collision showing that the energy, the kinetic energy specifically, is not conserved. So that means some of the energy was lost through heat and sound. And now what we can do is look at it from a different perspective of looking at delta P, the change in momentum. Now, if we strictly take a look at the two kilogram object, um, which is this one over here, then we could do a mass of two and then look for its delta V. Our delta V is V final minus our V initial over here. So it's going to be one minus two, and that's going to give us negative two kilogram meters per second for the impulse for our two kilogram ball. Now, taking a look at our um, one kilogram ball, if we do the same thing, it has a mass of one. And then here is its VF, which is um, negative one minus its um, VI or V naught, which is negative three. So negative one minus negative three is basically negative one plus three. Um, so that's positive two. So the impulse of the second object is positive two. So you would notice that they are the same number, but different signs. And that is exactly what should happen if momentum is conserved. If one object loses two kilogram meters per second of uh, momentum, then the other one should gain two kilogram meters per second of momentum. So the delta P for the two kilogram mass would equal the same thing as the other one, except different signs for the one kilogram mass. So that is another perspective you can take. Um, you could use like this full drawn out version of the conservation of momentum with your pictures and arrows and negatives, um, which is the method that I like um, for looking at the conservation of energy. Um, this is the way to look at it, taking one half mv squared of each of your values and then comparing them. And then finally, if you want to use impulse, you know that the impulses of each of them are going to be the same value, same magnitude, but different sign. And that can also be a way that you can find unknown variables or solve for different pieces of information. So I hope that was helpful to you in looking at what momentum and impulse are, along with graphs, some terminology, taking a look at inelastic versus elastic, and then looking at a problem in a full, um, taking a full analysis of a problem and solving for all of these three things that we solve for. So we'll check these two because we finished them. Thank you very much for watching and listening.